At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. At Staples Business Advantage, we help you select from 2,000 break room products, so you can be sure there's something for everyone. Yum. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for beginners. There's also this idea that I can't start investing until I understand everything there is to know about the investing world. And what I always tell my artists is, look, as an actor, you would never say, I'm never taking a role until I'm an expert actor and know everything there is to know about acting. Because if you did, you would never take a role, right? Because there's always more to learn. And there's also learning in doing. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatillo. There's a cliche about the starving artist in the garret, creative individuals whose obsessions are sometimes at odds with financial well-being. To discuss this, I'm joined today by David Maurice Sharp. Hello, David. Hello, Phil. Great to be here. Yeah, lovely to meet you. David Marie Sharp is the author of The Thriving Artist, Saving and Investing for Performers, Artists and the Stage and Film Industries. In 2014, he was named a money hero for his work in financial literacy for artists by Money Magazine. David currently teaches at HB Studio in New York City and frequently does workshops for Entertainment Community Fund, Music Hairs Foundation and the SAG-AFTRA Foundation. Uh, I'm assuming that's Screen Actors Guild, just if we could go through that That's acronym. correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and the American Film and Television Radio Artists <laughs> is the other part of it. Yeah, they just merged not too long ago. So tell us about your career in the arts before you became involved in financial literacy. Definitely. Um, I moved to New York when I was just 18 uh, to attend New York University. Uh, I majored in drama, so I uh, had mostly primarily an acting background. But while I was there, I started working with choreographers and got very interested in dance. So ended up having a career primarily in modern dance, working with really great American choreographers like Anna Sokolow, Lucinda Childs, Rachel Lampert, Mimi Gerard. Because the longevity of a dancer's career tends to be a bit brief. I was very fortunate. I got to dance until I was about 39, uh, which is considered quite old for dancers. But I kind of transitioned then into doing more choreography and behind the scenes film work. So it was great. I still have some involvement in the arts, even though I'm not actively performing anymore. Uh, Do you still retain any flexibility? (laughs) <laughs> uh, not like I had certainly when I was dancing, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's, I definitely noticed the aches and pains a little more too. <laughs> um, you, you, you're very aware of your body from dancing. That's for sure. So is, is money, this is the money question, of course, is money more of a problem for creative people than normies? It is. And I, and I'm glad you used that term because I often in my classes talk about people who are non-artists is either ordinary people or regular people. And it's not meant in any way to be, you know, a diss on them. It's, it's just that they have a very different lifestyle. And a lot of artists find themselves working primarily as gig workers, right? And, they, and so because of that, their income tends to be fluctuating. So that presents its own set of problems, which is quite different than what people who are salaried and are getting some kind of retirement plan through their, the company that they work for for you know, 30, 40 years. It just creates a very different set of difficulties and ones that you know, I've found aren't primarily addressed by sort of the standard financial information. They're more geared towards the regular people. What was it like for you in your own personal financial journey? Was there an awakening for you when you realized you had to get your money shit together? The moment that I really sort of started finding my way into this other world of, of sort of financial literacy and investing was I was I had been hired to do a production of Cabaret, the musical Cabaret, and which ran for, I think, about 10, 11 weeks. And it was coming to an end. And I was suddenly faced with the, you know, typical, okay, I have to find a way to make some money now, because what this is going to this gig's going to end, and I'm going to be on to the next thing. It was still pretty early in my career. And I was struggling with the whole like, not being 100% sure of where the money was coming from and not liking that that lack of stability and sort of thinking I need to find a way to have a more stable lifestyle while I'm still pursuing the thing that I love to do while I can. So anyway, I was talking to a friend who recommended that I uh, look into doing some temporary work. 
I ended up, the first place they sent me was for an interview with a, a, a firm down on Wall Street. And the first question they said was, do you know anything about Wall Street or the stock markets? And I said, no, but I can learn. And of course, the resume that they had for the interview was all about you know, my performing. So the woman then said to me, okay, well, why don't you tell me about cabaret? What was that like you know, doing cabaret? And we ended up talking about my dance career. So I left the interview thinking, okay, there's not a chance in the world that this is going to this is going to happen. And by the time I got home, the agency called and said, they want you to start like as soon as you can. And, and it ended up that while I was there, I started specializing in an area of their business that they didn't really have anybody else doing. They gave me complete flexibility in what I did. They offered to hire me. I said, I can't. I've, I've got to really dance while I can. And they said they would let me work 20 hours a week whenever I could fit it in. So I could go on tour, I could go to classes, I could do whatever I needed to do. And I learned about investing and the stock market and, and to a lesser extent, the bond market while I was there. And it was at that point that I started figuring out, okay, there's a way that we can use this to help with what I'm doing now. A lot of the time, the focus is always on, okay, we put everything away for retirement. I can use some of that same logic for what I'm doing now. How do I use these assets to sort of help stabilize my income stream and, and my financial well-being while I'm still dancing and don't have consistent income. And then it kind of just took off from there. That's an incredibly fortuitous set of circumstances. <laughs> it was, yeah. But, you know, I also, I always tell people because they say, oh, wow, that was really lucky. And I said, you know, I'm a big believer in grabbing the opportunities when they come to you, mm. right? I could have just as easily said, I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to try to learn. I'm just going to put in my time and, and go. And I instead, I really tried to say, okay, I have to do this because that's what, it, what I need to do in order to keep dancing. So what, how can I mold this to make it work and, and not diminish from our artistic career. So I think it's really important to, for me, it's always been very important, and I think for everybody it should be, to take advantage of the things that come your way and, and not think that just because you're maybe coloring outside the lines that that's not okay, that you're perfectly fine to do that, <laughs> you know? And a lot of times great things come from that. And better than waiting tables. Exactly. What was the nature of the work? They worked on primarily like annual meetings for corporations, but then they got involved in proxy fights, contested elections, um, tender offers, things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the proxy fight area was, was where I started to specialize in because it was very high stakes, a lot of money, was involved in it, and they just didn't have anybody doing what I did. And interestingly, it came down to, to a lot of attention to detail, which is exactly what you have in the arts, right? So, and they were being able to think about how to do things in a different way. And I, you know, if I had a dollar for every time I was in a meeting with them and they said, wow, that's a really creative idea. I was like, no kidding. <laughs> that's what we're trained to do in the arts. You know, it really assisted me in finding my niche there and then becoming invaluable to them so that they had to then give me what I wanted. Choreographing a I, proxy fight. Exactly. Basically. Just for listeners who don't understand what a proxy fight is, this is to do with the voting intentions of major shareholders in corporations that will affect um, board decisions. Is that correct? Essentially, with a proxy fight, it's, it, you know, companies every year, publicly traded companies have to have an annual meeting where they elect the board of directors and, and certain other pieces of business. If there's a, a rival group of people that want to take control of a company, they can put their slate of nominees for the board up for election. And then the shareholders have to vote between the different slates. And depending on whichever group of directors gets elected, that's who is in control of the company. So you could represent either the company and try to prevent dissident board members from taking their seat, or you could work for the dissidents and, and try to get their board members seated so that they can basically take over the company in that way. I was interested to hear in another interview uh, that you were on in a podcast, and you were talking about that um, you realized that many creative people considered money going into investments was kind of like an abyss that they didn't understand. Can you explain that thought for me, please? Sure. Yeah. I, I found in, in a lot of the classes that I teach that you, when students come into the class, they usually have this deer in the headlights look because it's something that we're not, you know, financial literacy, as you know, is not something that's really emphasized or taught. And there's this big fear of 
what it actually is and what it means to invest. I always liken it to this idea of throwing money into this dark abyss and just sort of keeping fingers crossed that something's going to come back out of it at some point. I like to tell people, instead of doing that, let's try to change the way we think about this, right? And let's start thinking of our investments as being our employees, and they're going to be working for us instead of like this scary other that we don't really know what it is. They work for us. We don't have to listen to them complain. We don't have to feed them. They're just sort of chugging away 24-7. And in that way, you can sort of reduce the fear of what you're doing, and it can incentivize you to sort of jump in and actually give it a try. Are there any other misconceptions that people arrive at your workshops with? A lot of them think I have to have a lot of money before I can start doing any of this. So there's no point to really even trying before I have that. Nothing, especially these days, nothing could be further from the truth. And year after year, it's becoming increasingly easy to get involved in investing with very, very small amounts of money. And the great thing about doing that is, number one, you create a web of investments and a well-being platform for yourself that will continue to build. And then when you do have an influx of cash, you know exactly what to do with it, right? Another reason is that you want to get your investments starting to work for you sooner rather than later. And importantly, there's also this idea that I can't start investing until I understand everything there is to know about the investing world. And what I always tell my artists is, look, as an actor, you would never say, I'm never taking a role until I'm an expert actor and know everything there is to know about acting. Because if you did, you would never take a role, right? Because there's always more to learn. And there's also learning in doing. So by finding these ways of getting involved in investing in assets with very small amounts of money, you create the educational environment for yourself as well so that you can learn so that you then are more confident in the next choices that you make. Those are what I call sort of the light bulb moments with the students where they go, oh, wait a minute, I can actually do this. And it does actually make sense. And it's not something that I'm not going to be able to understand. I've seen parallel situations um, because I'm dealing a lot with a lot of marketing people in the finance industry and they always tell me that they've they've come into the industry they had no idea about finance but then they they suddenly start learning about it and go oh it really isn't that hard it's not it but it is like kind of learning another language right where you, and you just have to if you know that and you say you know you wouldn't expect to sit down and learn german after one lesson and be able to speak it fluently right or some other language you need to it's something that you just have to keep familiarizing yourself with the terminology and the ideas of it, but it's certainly nothing that is beyond the ability of anyone to learn. You just have to be given the pathway into it. So how can people start investing with small amounts of money? There's a lot of funds now. You know, It used to be that they had a, a large amount of money that you needed to do in order to get into a mutual. Mutual funds are probably one of the simplest ways to start getting investing. And just for clarity, a mutual fund is a collection of assets. I like to talk about it as a basket of assets that a financial overseer, financial manager puts a lot of different things into and you buy a piece of the basket. So you get exposure to everything that's in that basket of assets, which gives you instant diversification, which is great because that reduces the risk that you're taking because you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. There are a lot of mutual funds now where you can get start buying shares of the mutual fund for as little as a dollar at a time. So it's very inexpensive to get involved in that. Exchange-traded funds are another type of asset similar to mutual funds in that it's a collection of assets that you're buying a piece of. Exchange-traded funds or ETFs trade on the market, more like shares of stock. But where it used to be that you had to buy a number of shares, um, and usually a bigger number because they charge fees for it. Most of the fees have gone away, especially for ETFs. So you can buy as little as one share at a time. A lot of the brokers are now also allowing you to buy fractional shares. So you could put $5 into an ETF and just buy a fractional piece of the ETF or a fractional piece of a share. So there are a lot of options for getting into investing. There are also things called robo-advisors, which set up funds where the, someone else is actually picking the portfolio for you based on some questions that you answer to determine how much risk you can take. And a lot of those, you can just put in a little bit of money, like five, ten dollars a month, and then they'll do all the investing for you. We're very fortunate right now to have a lot of ways of getting exposure to different kinds of investment assets 
using as little as a dollar or or five dollars or ten dollars. Can you share a, a case study of a student and um, the process that they went through? I can. Yeah, I have. I, I obviously get a lot of range of of people, um, and certainly the earlier they start, the better. But I did have one student who had had a very successful career and was continued to have a successful career as a soap opera actress and doing some teaching, et cetera, et cetera, but was in her late sixties and came to me and, and, and took some of my classes and then um, had a private consult with me and, and was like, I don't have really any money saved or any, anything. I think she had some IRAs that were invested in like certificates of deposit. It wasn't even in in any kind of other asset. We worked to set up some mutual funds that she could get into to sort of establish some income producing assets for her just to help supplement income, kind of migrate out of these cash vehicles in these retirements so that you were getting more aggressive stocks and bonds and everything else. And she's now in her early 70s, so it's only been a few years, refers to herself as the mogul, (laughs) <laughs> because she's obsessed with what she's doing. She's now researching individual stocks to buy pieces of and and has done um, incredibly well for herself and can feel the security of knowing that she's created and continues to create this financial wellness plan. And every time she laments and says, oh, I wish I had done this you know, 30 years ago when I was starting out, my response is always, yeah, would it it would have been great, but you didn't. And you did it when you did. And look at how well that served you. So don't spend a lot of time beating yourself up about what you didn't do in the past, but just look towards the future and what you're doing. And it's never too late to start then, obviously. It is never too late to start. Mm. It's never too late to start. And it's great to see that. It's great to see that at any age, there are there are steps that you can take to build your financial wellness plan easily and affordably without it being terrifying and the security and um, the confidence that it gives you, the empowerment that it gives you. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Some artists have the opposite problem where they suddenly have a large amount of money. It's the same with athletes. I've talked to former athletes who are now in the financial space, very similar to this as well. And some people just blow it straight away. (laughs) Are you seeing this as well with with artists that suddenly they they come into great deals of money but uh, don't know how to hang on to it? I do, yeah. And that's that kind of speaks to the whole heart of the feast or famine mentality, right? When you're you're not working very much, you're you're subsisting on what little you you are making. And when you suddenly get a huge influx, you spend it all because you think it's never going to end. Um, and, and and artists artists tend to be very friendly people and have got lots of f- uh, poor friends as well. And they want to go and take everyone out and shout them to restaurants and bars as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and celebrate the fact and, and, and you get, you know, you get tired of the sort of frugal, I have to live on saltine crackers mentality all the time. And so when you do have money coming in, it is nice to blow it. I'm not one of the Scrooges that tells them don't ever spend a lot of money because I don't think, you know, as artists, you need to, to fill the creative well, right? So you do need to enjoy your life, but you do also have to be practical about it. What I found is that once they start to build this sort of financial wellness plan with even the small amounts of money that they do, when they have a huge influx of money, like they get a film project or they get a TV series that they shoot for a while, or they're on Broadway for a a period of time, they don't tend to blow as much because they have things already in place and they realize how valuable it is because they've been able to see the growth of these investments, even with small amounts. So they say, oh, well, okay, yeah, I want to go out to eat and I want to take my friends out for this, but I'm going to make sure that I allocate money towards there too, because I can see how much it's going to help me in the long run. So again, I think the education by doing really helps get you away from that mentality a little bit. I also usually tell them, you know, try to try to figure out what I call your monthly nut, which is how much it takes to get you through any given month and pay yourself a paycheck of that amount of money. So regardless of whether you're making a lot of money or a small amount of money, 
you kind of trick yourself into being a salaried employee of yourself, right? Um, so you're paying in, and then you can treat yourself a little bit when you have that extra influx, but you really get into the habit of this is how much money I need to spend every month. And if I can make more, great, I can bank it. If I make less, I can borrow from what I've banked. So that that kind of helps get away from that mentality as well. Do you find artists have to be, how do they come to you? Are they, are they forced into it? Does some, someone tell them that they should go and see you? Or um, it's purely voluntary, I'm assuming. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them find their way to me through the the classes that I do um, through community or the entertainment community fund or HB studio, a lot of them realize that they need to, they need to address this. They're just fearful of doing it. Uh, a lot of the education that's out there also isn't geared towards artists. So it's not particularly helpful for them to go into, because then, you know, what you're faced with is you have to first understand what they're talking about with just the financial literacy part of it. And then you have to figure out how to apply it to what you're doing. And they realize that I get it because I've lived the life of an artist. I know what that's like and, and I you know, can help sort of bridge that gap for them. It was very interesting during the pandemic because obviously artists were, were sort of doubly hit because they most, most of the sources of creative work that they were doing shut down, but also their sort of subsistence jobs of waitering or you know, doing things like that shut down or, or were depleted. So um, they were hit very hard. My expectation was that there were going to be a lot of artists sort of sitting back and sort of, you know, whinging about, oh, poor me, poor me. My classes exploded in, in attendance because they were like, well, as long as we can't really do anything, we might as well start education, <laughs> educating ourselves on what to do when we can actually start working again. So I was very proud of the community for that that they really took that time to educate themselves and, and say, okay, I have no excuses now that I don't have time. I can sit down and I can sort of figure out how this can. That's a real can-do attitude. And presumably, uh, if they started investing, you know, in early to mid-2020, they've done reasonably well as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was a great time to jump into the market, again, even with small amounts of money, because the market was so low at that time. These lessons are obviously for ordinary people as well, not just for creative people. How would you suggest that people narrow down the choices as they approach their investments? I always find people can get very overwhelmed very easily because there's such a wide variety of things out there, right? I like to sort of start narrowing the choices down by having people ask some, some very basic questions and then you just kind of keep narrowing the field down. So we start with Look at your financial well-being plan as having two silos. You have your later life or your retirement silo, and then you have your non-retirement, your regular. Which one of those do you want to think about what you should be investing in first? That's your first question. Once you know that, start thinking about what, what do I want this particular investment to do, right? Do I want to have an investment that's generated income? that I can potentially use. Um, it's kind of like the goose that lays the golden egg. You know, I, you don't have to kill the goose to take the eggs. That's investing for income or you're investing for capital gains where you're just hoping that the asset will grow, but the only way you can take value out of it is to actually sell the asset. Then start thinking about how much risk you want to take. Are you someone who likes to jump into the deep end of the pool? Or are you someone like me who takes a half an hour to wade into the water because you're freezing and you can't stand to just jump in? If you're, le if you're more of a risk taker, you might want to lean more towards stock type investments. If you're more the, I'm going to take a half an hour to wade into the pool person, you might want to look more towards bonds. As you start building your portfolio and adding pieces to it, then you're going to start looking for holes and looking for exposure to other places. I also like to give the image of, you know, when you're thinking about your financial wellness plan, think of it as a big mosaic and you're putting different pieces of tile in at different times. Everyone is going to have a different piece of tile that they need to put in at any given time. Artists in particular don't fit into the formulas that the financial advisors use for the ordinary people. Even to be honest, I don't think the ordinary people always fit into those formulas either, but I think artists really, really don't. So it's, it's up to you to sort of look at your own circumstances and think about what is the next best 
thing for me at this moment. And then just add that one little piece to the puzzle and then go back later and, and, and figure out the next one that you need to add as well. So by narrowing it down, you kind of get away from be feeling overwhelmed. And you also don't, you don't have to do everything at once. Just pick one thing to do to get you started. Again, you're going to learn from doing that and then you can always supplement it. Do you ever find that creative people let their creativity run wild when they start investing as well? They can, yes. There's always that danger of they're like, I want to go, you know, I, I only want to do individual stocks. Um, and I'm not opposed to investing in individual stocks, but I would say, look, it, it can be very helpful to build a sort of boring core portfolio of mutual funds and ETFs that that nobody ever said got a l really excited telling their friends, "Hey, I own shares of XYZ large cap stock fund." You know, whereas if you say, "I have shares of McDonald's or I have shares of Coca Cola," there's there's it's much more exciting. But this the the kind of boring core things are what can allow you to to do some of the more exciting um, creative things. Marijuana stocks are big right now. I always, in literally every class, I get asked about buying marijuana stocks here or cryptocurrency is the other thing, which is an incredibly high risk peripheral investment, or I don't even know if I would use the term investment, but it's a peripheral kind of asset. Um, so I always say, you know, try to get the, the the kind of boring under your belt, you know, like as a dancer, I had to do tendus and plies all the time, and they were certainly not the most stimulating things to do. So try to yes express your creativity but but support it with the the sort of boring core stuff I, I get a feeling that the traditional financial services industry you, you alluded to this a, a moment ago are starting to look at the niches they're niching down into different areas because they realize that the old model of i guess was glossy brochures with happy retirees running down the beach um is not the answer anymore that they've got to be they themselves have got to become more creative in how they reach out to people are you finding that? I am, and I'm, and they also have, you know, to the point of that it's easier to get in with smaller amounts of investing. They're realizing that whereas before they might have targeted only high net worth individuals, there are advantages now to having a lot of clients that maybe aren't as high net worth because that, as an aggregate, can also be a, a group that they're interested in supporting. The one sort of negative element of that that I find is that in order to make it efficient for them, they tend to be automated and tend to be formulaic, and that doesn't always work. So what I usually say to people is, look, there's nothing wrong with going with a financial institution or a financial advisor, but understand that you're going to have to be participatory in it. You can't just sit back and say, just do your thing, because especially for people in the arts or people who are freelance or people who don't fit into that box, you have to help them figure out what you need for your lifestyle. They don't understand it and their formula doesn't understand it. So try to be as participatory in it as you can, because there are there is a lot of the computerization of everything, um, which doesn't speak to our individuality at all. I'm kind of imagining that these workshops are a lot of fun as well. Is that the case? They, they I mean, are. we're talking big personalities here. <laughs> yeah, I like to think of them as being really fun. Yes. Like I said, a lot of times when they begin, especially people that are, haven't been in any of my workshops before, there's this sort of deer in the headlight. I'm about to have a root canal without anesthesia kind of look on people's face. And then um, as it goes along, they start they realize, and I try to incorporate humor into it too, because I think that humor um, is an important tool for learning, right? You have to kind of laugh at, we have to laugh at ourselves and we have to laugh at the situations and it can be fun. You know, it should be fun. But yes, then you start to hear the stories of what these people are doing and, and, and how they relate to it. And, and it's really fascinating how, how much fun it can be. I had one student who years and years ago was in some classes and then came back many years later and she worked in production on uh, for like Bloomberg Television, just you know on the floor. I, I forget exactly what her job was. She was like an assistant stage manager or something like that, assistant director. And she sort of overheard one of the cameramen one day talking about a stock that he was interested in or something. And she happened to go talk to him. And pretty soon they had a group of people and this crew comparing investments and talking about strategies and and they 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 created this whole dynamic 
which was fantastic. So I always tell people, look, don't be afraid to talk to your peers about it. We have There's this element of shame about financial information. You know, we're not supposed to talk about investing. We're not supposed to talk about finances. And I think that's rubbish. I mean, I think we should talk about it because, and, and, and embrace the fun of, of doing it and, and how empowered it can make you. And the more you share, the more ideas you get and the more that you can kind of bring everybody into going along for the ride with you. Yes, because I did imply that we we're only talking about actors and musicians and those kind of creative people, but then there's all of the production people as well that are in a very similar situation. They are creative people, but uh, for them it's a gig economy as well. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And, um, you know, the costumer, the costume people, the props people, um, I, I have spoken to the musicians unions to talk to them because that's a whole different lifestyle as well. Fine arts people, the the painters and the crafts people out there. Um, we're definitely seeing a shift in the work environment into more and more freelance type work, even in what would be considered traditional sort of ordinary jobs. You're starting to see more freelance work and more gig opportunities because people, I think, want to have more control over what they do. They don't want to a company saying, okay, we, we own you for the next 40 years or whatever. That's just not the, the way. And it's, we're definitely shifting to that. So people do have to start thinking about how can I make that work and feel comfortable in that? And it's an exciting time because I think the more we're in, we feel in charge of what we're doing, the, the happier we are basically. Right. So David, tell us how people can find out more about you and especially if they're starving artists in the garret. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a website, davidmariesharp.com. I keep that up to date with any speaking engagements that I have coming up. Uh, I have a book out, as you mentioned, The Thriving Artist, which published um, a few years ago that they're welcome to pick up a copy of that. That goes through de in, in detail, very basics of investing. It's like a primer for investing, very short chapters because it's geared towards people that aren't going to sit there and read a 40-page chapter on bonds. And I also have um, all my social media is also available on my website. I set up a, um, a monthly reminder, monthly check-in for people with some ideas. There's a form on my website if you would like to be a part of that. You can um, just shoot me an email or send me, fill out that form, and I'd be happy to add you to that list and drop in in one of my classes. Some of them, a lot of them, like at Entertainment Community Fund, they're free to anybody in the performing arts from anywhere in the world. The great thing, the other great thing that happened in the pandemic is everything went online. So now anybody in the world can literally come in and listen to some of these classes. So um, there's a lot of opportunity. But yeah, my website would be a good place to start. Oh, well, we'll put all the links in the show notes and the episode notes and blog post as well so people can find you easily just by a click of a button. David Marie Sharp. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. At Staples Business Advantage, we help you select from 2,000 break room products so you can be sure there's something for everyone. Yum. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.